In this episode, I interview my friend William Green. Many of you will know who William Green is because he and I collaborated on my book, The Education of a Value Investor. Uh, he lived with us for around three months as we worked through every single chapter of my book. And if you haven't heard of William Green, you're very likely to because the reason for the conversation with William is that he's about to publish his own book. His own book is called Richer, Wiser, Happier, and in uh, what the uh, great investors can teach us about investing and life, more importantly. And uh, in many ways, if my book is a kind of a documentation of my own, this flawed individual's quest for wealth, wisdom, and enlightenment, William's book can be thought of as a the answers to so many of the questions that I have or had, and it's the answers not provided by William, but provided by William's study of some of the world's greatest investors and the opportunities that he's been afforded to speak to them, interview them, and develop some really quite close relationships with a broad number of those investors. And one of the premises of the book is that they have so much to teach, more to teach than just how to invest well. They have an awful lot to teach about how to live well, hence the title of the book, Richer, Wiser, Happier. And it's epitomized by, for example, the life of people like Charlie Munger, but also people like Tom Gaynor and somebody called Nick Sleep, about whom you'll learn quite a bit more. There's a chapter devoted to him called Nick and Zach's Excellent Adventure. And I'm looking at a photograph right now it's a photograph, and I'm looking at it right now on my iPhone, of Charlie Munger engrossed in the book. And he's holding up the book, and he's sitting in a plush armchair. Too plush for me. I would find it too soft. I like my Ames chairs. But Charlie Munger's engrossed in the book, and you can't see his face. And I know that he really enjoyed the book. He really enjoyed the chapter on Monish Pabrai and other chapters. And he feels like he learned an awful lot about the investors in the book, many of whom he knows personally, but he learned things about them that he didn't know before. I understand that he really enjoyed the book and he's read it more than a couple of times and he might recommend it, we'll see. And the conversation with William that you're about to listen to does not go into the content of the book. And the reason for that is that I feel like you should buy it and read it. But I talked to William about how he ended up becoming a writer uh, the difficulties of writing, the difficulties, uh, well, just a lot about, because I joke with William, I say that I'm a civilian writer, whereas he's a professional. And uh, to be a professional writer is really a, a, quite a difficult life. It's not entirely clear to me why somebody would choose that. But we can be grateful to William that he has, because he's been our eyes and ears in places that we would not have been able to go. And we also cover some other topics. There's a question at the end about Isaac Bosheva Singer. We talk a little bit about the Kabbalah. And I think that you will really enjoy this conversation. I enjoyed it. And once you've listened to the conversation, go out and buy the book. I think it's one of those books that will raise your IQ by two or three uh, points. And if it doesn't raise your IQ, it'll certainly give you a little bit more common sense. Uh, thank you and enjoy the episode. So, William, it's great to have you on this podcast. I am very happy to be here with you guys. And I, I just need you to know that it's an extraordinary opportunity for me because any time that we would normally talk, I would not have the opportunity necessarily to ask you penetrating questions. So this is the chance to ask you penetrating questions. Yeah, it's a little scary. I, I asked <laughs> my son, Henry, about half an hour ago if he had any advice. And he said, yeah, don't say anything stupid. <laughs> no, so I'm all set. <laughs> So, we, in many ways, our lives have paralleled each other, but in other ways, they've been completely different. And for me, it's really fascinating to learn. I want to hear the story of the book, I guess, and I want to learn how the book arrived in your life. And perhaps you can tell a little bit about your journey all the way from school to becoming the writer that you are today. Well, I'd always wanted to be a writer. I, I think I I surprised myself when I was probably about nine years old, where a great uncle of mine, who was a professor of politics at Nottingham University, said to me, William, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, well, I want to write. And I'm not sure I'd ever consciously thought about it. But I think pretty much from 
from then I always intended to write and I always revered books. That was always what I wanted to do. But then I got an agent when I was about 20 or 21, when I had left Oxford and I thought I was going to be this sort of high flying writer. And I misfired with an early book proposal that I did where I didn't yet have the skills to do it. And then I started to write for magazines and I got waylaid in some ways almost for 20 years because magazines were so much easier for me than books because instead of having to write very long form, you would write an 800 word article or a 650 word article or a 2000 or 4000 word article. And it was just more manageable. And my mind goes all over the place. And so to be able to synthesize a small amount of information and get in a page or two pages or even eight pages of a magazine was very doable. And then after about 20 something years of doing that, I, I guess I had become a magazine editor, which was even easier than, um, than writing for magazines. Not that writing for magazines is easy, but editing other people's work was much easier because you weren't staring at the blank page. And I found that kind of joyfully easy. It, it was almost like a party trip. You could take other people's prose and figure out what they wanted to say. And so because I found it relatively easy, it got me further and further away from, I think, what I should have been doing, which is what I'd always wanted to be doing all along, but was too scary, which was writing books and too difficult. And then I got kind of cast out of the kingdom in 2008, 2009, where I got I was editing the European, Middle Eastern, and African edition of Time. And when everything kind of melted down during the financial crisis, I got laid off. And so then suddenly at the age of 40, I had to decide, well, so what am I actually going to do? What, what, and, and it was, it was a particular crisis for me in multiple ways because the, um, my industry collapsed as well. And so it wasn't just that the thing I was really good at and that I'd been doing for all these years, which was editing magazines was no longer available to me. It was that my industry was collapsing. And so I sort of panicked and initially took a really good job at another magazine, but that wasn't really right for me. And then, and then I quit and started ghostwriting books. And that in a way was a good way to get back into writing because I could still sort of hide behind somebody else's name. And so I just had a lot of words flowing through me with a lower risk of judgment and failure because I was writing in someone else's name. And I think that was tremendously helpful. And then finally, I started writing my own books and I I'd collaborated on other books, but this, in a sense, this book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, which is coming out now, is the first time truly that I've flown alone and flown free and had truly my own thing. And I'm not partnering with anyone, which is sort of thrilling and terrifying simultaneously, but actually, I, I, and it's taken me four, four years probably from the start, but it's may, maybe even long because I probably can't admit to myself how long it's actually <laughs> taken, but it's far and away the most satisfying and fulfilling thing I've ever done. Because in a sense, it was a thing that I wanted to do 25, 30 years ago, but wasn't yet ready to do and, uh, and probably didn't have the skills yet to do, but also didn't really have the courage to do, I think. You know, I, I think that in a certain sense, your book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, which is, I guess, the excuse for having this conversation or the reason why we're having this conversation for me, when I look at it is, in a certain way, it's it's been 50, 50 something years in the making, it's a culmination of everything. So that, that's, it's it's really, really exciting, actually. And, and I, I want to get to the book. But before we get there, if we just go to the writing that you were doing, and as you know, so I, for the audience, I consider William to be a, a prof he is a professional writer, obviously. And as you know, I've kind of done a foray into the writing world, but I'm a civilian in that world. And every time I've written anything of value, it's been extraordinarily painful. I know that I have not given birth to a child, but I would like in any worthwhile piece That's of writing right. for me to being kind of like a process of giving birth. And and I just have, I, so so I was interested to hear that editing is easier, but is, is writing that painful for you? Or are you just made of different stuff? Is all writing, good writing, 
but is it just me who finds it painful? Can you explain what it's like for you? It's very painful in certain ways and at different stages of the process, but there are aspects of it that are deeply joyful. And my attitude to writing has changed over the years. So in the early days of being a writer, my image of it was a, of a war of attrition. And there's a beautiful line from Hemingway where he said that the first rule of writing is apply seat of pants to seat of chair. And so I had this sense that if I just sat there and I was willing to grind it out, eventually it would become kind of perfect. And I would just, I would just stay there do, doing battle with myself and with my resistance until it got perfect. And I'm very obsessively perfectionist. So, so it really was just this war of attrition. And I, I think that's one reason why I stopped writing for a long time and focused on editing was because there was so much less of my own vulnerability on display. It wasn't, I think because I have very high standards for myself, I always was worried that somehow I was going to be judged as lacking, but it was, it was judging myself as lacking as much as anything. And so I felt very exposed when I wrote. And I think it just became emotionally draining. It was very hard. Uh, whereas editing other people's stuff, it's grueling because you're dealing with a lot of different personalities and you have a lot of things flying at you. I mean, e editing a magazine, like I edited the Asian edition of Time magazine, then the European edition. And I worked incredibly hard. It was very intense, but it was intense in a different way. You just had a lot of things flying at you and you were working very long hours, but you weren't exposed in quite the same way. But I think my image of writing in my own mind has changed over the years. And even though it can be painful, it is kind of weirdly joyful. And I think part of what changed over the years is that I, I decided at a certain point that I wanted to be a conduit for something beyond my own ego. So instead of it just being about how are people going to judge me and will they think I'm smart and will they think my ideas are good and will they think my prose is beautiful and stuff like that, I started to think, okay, well, let me just be a channel for something that's beyond my own ego that helps people. And I found the same thing with giving speeches that if you go into it thinking, are they going to think I'm fat? Are they going to think I'm stupid? <laughs> are they going to notice that, you know, I just spilled ketchup on my tie or whatever? So then you're coming from a very fragile place because it's all about your own ego. And I found once I started to give talks and think, I really hope that I'm going to say something that's going to help somebody in this audience. Mm. There's a flip in your own brain, I think, that removes a lot of the pressure, oddly because you're not just thinking about your own ego. And I, and that's made the book writing process, however difficult it's been, actually weirdly, weirdly joyous. Mm. Because when I was working on a chapter in this book and I was overwhelmed by the amount of material and information and, and, and the fact that I was always behind. I mean, I was always so far behind on my deadline. It was just kind of a joke, <laughs> yeah, terrible. I, I missed my deadline by I think two years, which probably means it was longer, but I can't bear to admit it to myself. <laughs> And I would say to myself, as I went, went to the computer, I would be like, let, let, me just, let me just write something that's going to help the reader. And once you soften in that way and you try to be a conduit, it sounds very self-righteous. And I don't want it to sound sort of sanctimonious or holier than now, but it's just being honest that it's actually, I think it's an extraordinarily powerful way to approach public speaking, work, writing, I think you soften around the stress of it when you're saying, let, let me just be helpful in some way. Let, let me say something that will help somebody. That changed the writing process for me. You know, there's a there's a term that I got to know in German, which I really enjoy. It's called Wohlfühlschmerz, which is the pain that feels good. Huh. So, you know, that that comes up for me as you as you talk about the writing. And as you know, I, I guess I'm not the world's greatest seeker, but I've been a seeker. And I've sought change and, you know, the eternal light in all sorts of ways. And I, I actually think that ultimately the most, you know, of all the different coaching, psychotherapy forums, the, the, the process or the thing that I've done that has resulted in the most spiritual change in me has been my approach to writing as an amateur, the attempt to write something of value for somebody else. So I find that really interesting. I also find it interesting that in a certain way, 
in in your editing and in your you, you can certainly you know you edited you did more than edit my book we co-wrote it but in your helping others to write you're actually it's moving from an egotistical place to helping another person express ideas that the world ought to hear to at the end in your book in a certain way you're now just connecting up to the sort of the source of wisdom if you like but but you've spent a certain period of years i would say with some really powerful personalities sort of where you're kind of acting as their voice in a certain way i don't know if you want to t- either to talk about yeah. the volschfuhlschmelz or helping other people to express themselves yeah and i'm constrained in what i can say publicly about who i've helped write their books but I mean I worked on a book in 2017 that became a number one bestseller that was for someone really famous and who's very impressive and very remarkable and so spending time with him was an extraordinary experience and oddly that's someone who wasn't trained as a writer and I've learned stuff from him about how to write which is curious that there are people who they're not trained as writers but they understand the art of of rhetoric and engaging an audience and i think i sorry to sound secretive but i think this person that i wrote a big book with he has a tremendous sense of service and i think that was powerful for me because there was a point where i sort of said you know look i i've i've tended to write with so much of a sense of fear and and this need to be perfect and to do everything brilliantly and and if i dismantle that like what what do i replace it with and it was sort of a pause and i said so you know service and he just <laughs> got it. and and i think i mean it sounds kind of platitudinous but it's actually really profound that once you actually get out of your own way and you decide that you want to be of service it's incredibly liberating yeah and because it removes a lot of the blockage of fear of judgment and there's a terrific book actually that it i i think is very helpful for writers and creative people but actually probably for people in in most fields which is this book the war of art which is um you know a nice play on the art of war i think it's by this guy stephen pressfield i can't find my copy because i'm pretty sure i gave it to one of my kids because they're both writers although much younger one one's 19 and one's 22 but i think one of the things that that book the war of art is very profound about is this idea that when you're trying to do something worthwhile there's this force of resistance that you come up against both internally and externally that's very powerful that prevents you from doing it that gives you all sorts of excuses for things you want to get busy with that will, will take you away from the thing that you actually should be doing and look this took the fact that i was a successful magazine writer and editor for 25 or so years and then a ghostwriter took me away i think from what i should have been doing and so it was seductive enough my success in that area that it justified me avoiding the pain and challenge and difficulty of writing my own book and so i think the ego plays these subtle tricks on you hmm. so it it convinces you that you're doing these things because you're supporting your family and you're just responsible or because you're really good at it or because you know and i think you just have to be really honest with yourself about what actually am i here to do what am i supposed to do and what talents do i have that i need to take advantage of and i would tell you william that i'm very excited for richer wiser happier because i think that on first read i happen to know you perhaps extremely well and so i can see it we've had conversations about the book throughout the time that you're writing it but i think that there are layers of meaning in the book and in a certain sense i think that everything that you learned as an editor and in other places it kind of you had to go there to get to the place where you could write the book that you wrote and it's deeply textured in its meaning and i think that the fact that you reworked the chapters multiple times and brought them up to your extraordinary high standards of perfection is it, i'm just really excited to see how the book gets received and you know we you, you also said something to me very early on in the process i think before i started writing the book that was actually very helpful to me where you said you need to actually include william green in this book you need to talk about why you're so obsessed with these investors yeah. why why investing interests you and i think 
because I'd been hiding in certain ways behind writing other people's books or writing articles about other people, there was something quite scary about writing about myself and putting myself in it. And in some ways, you saying that, I think, gave me permission psychologically to say, yeah, why is it that I'm interested in this? And one thing that I realized along the way, which was curious, was that I was writing about all of these people who were very, they're great investors, and, and I'm not a great investor, but they're all very, very independent-minded thinkers who were searching in some way for a true way to see the world. Yeah. And they're very open-minded and they're, they're on some kind of quest and their, their wealth and intelligence has allowed them to break free from society in some way and create their own path. Mm. And I can see in retrospect why that would resonate with me because I'm, I'm a sort of smart alecky, slightly subversive outsider mm. who doesn't want to be told what to do by anybody mm. at all. And so the the thrill of investing for me, I think, from the start was this idea that if you thought well, you could become financially independent. And there's there's something in the last chapter of, of the book, the epilogue of the book, where Arnold Vandenberg, who's a, a key character in the book, says that he, he didn't intend to become like hugely rich. He wanted to make something like $250,000 that would enable him to live for 10 years. And he said... I just didn't want to have to take shit off anybody. <laughs> and I, that that resonates really deeply oh. with me. And so it's interesting when you start to think about why you're actually drawn to sort certain people and why you want to want to write about them. You you can peel back the layers and you discover that actually you're you're projecting onto people all of these things and the people you focus on. No, I don't think anybody I focused on is a sort of cog in a big machine. They're all independent thinkers yeah. trying to solve the puzzle of how to think better, invest better, and live more wisely, which is what I'm trying to do. So let's get into it. Look, the book for me stands as something that ought to, has to be read by anybody who's listening to this. And I don't want to do any real plot, plot spoilers for the book. I think there's so much richness. I don't want anybody to think that they can get any sense of the book by listening to William speaking. You have to read the book and but you actually started telling the story of how the idea for the book germinated and how how it got started and so the the introduction is kind of maybe i have a piece of that in that it i didn't realize that me telling you to put yourself as a character in the book so to speak was important but but that actually sets up the stage because it sets up your curiosity and some of the material for the book goes back to some of your earliest days as a as a writer for some of these magazines, but when did you come to the realization that this was the book that you wanted to write, actually? I think probably about five years ago, I started to realize I have this extraordinary material that I've accumulated over many years where I've just interviewed unbelievable people because as I say at the start of the book, I became obsessed with investing about 25 years ago personally but I was just in this very peculiar, unique position where I, I had a, a not very large amount of money to invest, but I had this, this small windfall from selling an apartment with my brother that, that we had owned together in London. And so I needed to figure out what to do with the money. So I start reading a lot about investing and I became kind of obsessed with this idea that, okay, here's something where if you think, well, you can actually make money without doing very hard work. You know, you don't have to go mow lawns or, you know, work in an office or and, and get my hands dirty in any way that seemed unseemly and, and far too difficult for me. So that was the fantasy, was that if I could think well, I would be able to become really financially independent and, and secure. But what was magnificent was that because I was writing for things like Forbes and then money and fortune and time, I could actually go interview these extraordinary investors. And so I had this excuse to do things like go spend a day with Sir John Templeton or interview Marty Whitman or interview Jack Bogle or go to Houston and interview Fire Seraphim, who was nicknamed the Sphinx, <laughs> I think, because he just never talked to anyone. He was this Egyptian billionaire who never talked publicly. So I just got to interview these extraordinary people. And then over the years, I kept... Even, even when I was an editor at Time Magazine, I still would write these columns intermittently where I would interview someone like Bill Miller, who 
I think I've interviewed for somewhere between 80 and 100 hours over the last 20 mm. years. I mean, I spent so much time with someone like Bill. And so I had this incredible resource of all of these years of, of interviews. And then I worked on this book, The Great Minds of Investing as well, that enabled me to interview, I think, 22 of these investors, 22 great, uh, mostly great investors, some really extraordinary investors. And then I thought, well, wait, there are people here that I've never heard of that I've interviewed. What if, what if, say, someone like Howard Marks, who I got to interview for The Great Minds of Investing, what if I could really go deep on exploring what Howard's figured out about how to handle the fact that everything is changing constantly and the future is unknowable? How do you deal with that philosophical and practical problem? And so what I thought with this book is, if I could draw on all of these great interviews that I had over the last 25 years, and then I can go really deep on the most interesting, most thoughtful, most intelligent, and most exemplary human beings, the people I actually want to spend time with and learn from, not, not just about investing, but about life, that would be an amazing thing. And if I can then synthesize and distill those lessons from these extraordinary people, that's going to help me tremendously in life. Mm. But it's actually going to be really valuable for readers. And so that's what I set out to do. And I, and I did it in a kind of insane way with this book, because at a certain point, I just decided I'm not saving anything for another book. I'm putting everything that I have that's good. I'm playing for keeps here. And there's a, there's a beautiful line from one of my favorite novelists, a guy called Ford Maddox Ford, who was incredibly prolific. And he wrote some like 85 books, but a lot of them were not great. And, and then he wrote some that were astonishing. He wrote a book called The Good Soldier that's one of the great books of the 20th century. And he said, I sat down at the age of 40 to show what I could do. And so I just thought, well, here I am. I'm in my late 40s, as I was then. Now I'm 52. <laughs> I'm in my late 40s, I've been a, a deliverer of other people's prose for all of these years while quietly writing on my own as well, intermittent articles and other people's books. Let me sit down and actually be like, all right, I'm going to see what I can do now. And then I think partly also because of COVID, you start thinking, well, we're all pretty mortal. And let me try to create one thing that I'm really proud of. And so the stakes kind of kept going up. Mm. And I, I don't know, people will probably read the book now and be like, it sucks. I can't believe he put so, <laughs> you know, he talks about it in such a portentous way. But this is, this is my internal monologue anyway. This is what I was trying to do. I was trying to do something where I really, I took all of this very special information that I've been privileged to have, went big on talking to the most remarkable people mm. that I'd encountered, and then really tried to distill the essence of what I've learned in a way that would help people and in a way that might actually endure. Because I was thinking, you know, who knows how long I survive? I want to write a book that people will be able to read in 20, 30 years. And so that's setting myself up for failure. But that's, if I'm honest about it, that's what I've been trying to do. The, I didn't realize this. You, what I'm learning from you now, William, is quite how high the stakes were. And I, I, I have this image for... Uh, there's a couple of images while William takes a rest and takes a sip from whatever you're drinking mm. that I'll uh, share with the listener. So one is... Uh, it's 10 5 in the morning. So, well, so, so the, I, I remember when we, we were reworking chapters of my book and we'd be discussing things and we've had this conversation, William. And, and so the, William would go, there'd be sort of a grayness that would descend on William and, and you'd start seeing... The, the weight of the chapter as you know, and I would have written this kind of loose baggy monster of a chapter where what William would describe is that it's like a suit, but the legs are attached to the arm. And it was actually in, in the, in the granny flat of uh, our house in Zurich. And you would, you would descend there for an unknown amount of time, not to be disturbed, perhaps given cappuccinos as you kind of reworked, and chocolate, a lot of, a lot a lot of chocolate. Of chocolate. Yeah. Cappuccino, you figured out the two but, keys to my productivity. And and so what's extraordinary, I mean, you know, and I've acknowledged it publicly, but I, I'm far better speaking. There's, there's, there was this extraordinary gift that you gave me because you, you gave your whole body and soul over to the message that Guy Spear was trying to communicate in this chapter. And I remember one time, William, we did a read through of the chapter and then there was a couple of things where, where you kind of noticed that I, it didn't sit entirely comfortably with me, and I could see how tired you were. 
And I didn't want to say anything because it was really just fine. And I remember you coming up the next morning. We'd gone to bed at like 3 a.m. And you come up the next morning at 9 or so, and you'd rework those sentences. You'd noticed it. So, so that is the intensity for the listener with which William approached my book. It's not his words, my words. And having been at the rock face of writing, you've actually been in an extraordinarily difficult and lonely place. And, and you know, it's like climbing a mountain. I don't know how to describe it. It's you and the words and the world. Yeah, I would often feel like each, that was the image that I would use in my own mind, that, that each chapter is a, is a mountain. And so when you talk about that grayness, you know, just turning gray when you see, oh God, this chapter's a problem. Part of it, it I, I would often talk about how I would circle the beast for a while. You know, it was like you you would look at this beast and be like, ah, I don't dare go in yet, but you kind of circle it. And then you'd be like, all right, fuck it, I'm going. And, um, and so, uh, sorry, I don't know if your podcast has extremely strict language rules. Uh, you'll not. never be able to invite Polish on it if you're allowed to swear. But I think about this a lot with exercise and with going to the dentist and with medicine and stuff. I can I can see that, I have this sort of fear in advance of the pain mm. that I'm going to suffer. And I'm trying to work on it. I'm trying to soften around that pain and kind of lean into it more. And I've, I've done it quite successfully with things like going into the dentist and getting vaccinations and things like that. And I think I've done it fairly successfully with writing to lean into the pain a little bit more. But I do think it's very easy to get freaked out by the enormity of the task of trying to synthesize so much material. Because if you can imagine... If I'm if I'm writing about, say, Bill Miller, and I have 80 to 100 hours of interviews over the years, that's excruciating to try yeah. to think about what am I going to distill here? And what's the essence of what I want to say in probably two, 3,000 words, even less, maybe. And then the same thing with someone like Arnold Vandenberg, who I end my book with, who has this astonishing story. And... I'm guessing, I mean, I spent two days, two and a half days with Arnold in Austin, Texas, interviewing him, getting his story, reading his parents' diary, things like that. You know, I mean, his parents have been in Auschwitz and I'm, I'm reading all of this history. I'm reading letters from, uh, you know, this woman who saved Arnold's life when he was 17 and sort of sneaked him out of hiding into an orphanage in the countryside in Amsterdam because he was born on the on the street that Anne Frank was born on had to be had to be hidden during the Holocaust, and I've probably in, interviewed Arnold thirty times over the phone in addition to all that time I spent with him. So just the task of synthesizing all of this material and doing justice to it is is pretty overwhelming. And there there was a moment very early on where I told Monish Pabrai that I was really struggling with this chapter that I was writing about him, which is about cloning. And he, he wrote me a lovely uh, email back and he said, William, you were born to synthesize this material. <laughs> and it's tricky for me because I'm very obsessive. And so I do the reporting obsessively. So I get way too much material and I want the writing to be perfect. But actually my mind is pretty messed up. So I'm desperately trying to rein everything in, but my mind is all over the place and not very organized. And I'm not very organized in practical terms either. I'll, you know, I, would, I think there were months where I couldn't find this interview that I'd done with Peter Lynch 20 <laughs> years ago. I literally couldn't find it. And um, I finally found it. So yeah, I'm not, I, so, so I'm someone with very high ambitions and very low ability to organize myself or discipline my brain. But so, so, yeah, it's a, so, so you're climbing a lot of mountains with kind of, you know, with ha realizing that you took the wrong crampon or the wrong rope and, you know, you're halfway up and you're like, oh, shit, I, I forgot that I'm supposed to be on a different mountain. I just tell you that you, you brought out a, a, just briefly a quality of a monish, which is, you know, in, 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 in just saying three words, William, you were born to synthesize this stuff is kind of, it, it sort of shows to me a, a little bit of the brilliance of monish's mind because it shows... You know, he in three words, he's he's motivated you and paid you a, a, a beautiful compliment, actually, and he's done that very parsimoniously, which I think is beautiful. And you know, as I just was telling you, I was just with Monish in Austin, 
in Hill Country. And I should mm. tell you that the writer that comes to mind for me time and again when I read and reread Richer, Wiser, Happier is Robert Caro. I think there's an enormous mm. amount of Robert Caro in you. So Robert Caro, I'll let you introduce uh, the listener to Robert Caro if you don't, they don't know who Robert Caro is. For those who do, Robert Caro has, is well known for writing extraordinary long books. And I think that you worked far harder at synthesizing and distilling uh, to its essence. And I, I'll just give a couple of examples that, that I realize now, and it's this an example of this sort of like rich and layered texture to the book is, so the opening chapter, your selection of the scene of the opening chapter, which is, which is carting through the dark back alleys of India on the way to uh, Monish's foundation was actually not just chosen because it happened to be true. You also chose it because it's illustrative. It helps you to communicate, not just through words and description, you know, this show rather than tell of some really profound aspects of Monish's personality. And just to dive quickly, because I know there's, there's uh, the listener needs to know there's about 18 thoughts coming out of William's head at this point. But you know, just to give one other example, in the chapter on Nick's Sleep, you picked this book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. And you didn't just pick this book because Nick happened to have talked to you about it. I, I realized that you had copious notes and you're sort of saying to yourself, how do I, in the course of one short chapter, illustrate the key lessons that the reader needs to learn? And you realize that, you know, in the, in the Pabrai chapter, it's that road trip. In the sleep chapter, it's this, uh, you know, and that one part of it is this is the book that you use to communicate so much more than a few paragraphs could communicate. Uh, you know, that that's... You're, you're always trying to find a microcosm, uh, something emblematic of this massive material. And so for someone like like Robert Caro, who's this astonishing writer and, and reporter who, who spent basically half a century, I think, writing biographies of Lyndon Johnson that are just as astounding. He's going encyclopedic, right? Everything's going to be in there. <laughs> um, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm trying to get the essence of a person and an idea. And so I would keep saying to myself, what's the eye of the eye of the bullseye? Like if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to convey who Nick Sleep is or who Monish is or what what's the one idea that I need to learn from Charlie Munger? What's the eye of the eye of the target, of the bullseye? And so, for example, with someone like, like Charlie Munger, who I write a chapter on, it's called Don't Be a Fool. I think for me anyway, the, the, the essence of Charlie and what makes him so extraordinary is this paradox that you have one of the smartest people alive and so much of his focus is on not being stupid. And so that becomes the the central theme and everything of everything in that chapter is just variations on that theme. So I'm drawing in other people. There's an extraordinary guy in that chapter called Fred Martin, who started when he graduated from, I think, the business school at Dartmouth, went to Vietnam to be a lieutenant on a destroyer. And in the same month that he started in the US Navy in the middle of the Vietnam War, two other lieutenants on another destroyer screwed up and they, they turned in the wrong direction. Their ship was cut in two and 74 people died. And so that becomes a kind of metaphor for what happens when you do stuff that's stupid for the, and then I'm talking about Ken Schubenstein, a mutual friend of ours who remarkably quit the investment business a couple of years ago to become a neurologist. And he's using his techniques for not being stupid while treating patients in a, in a COVID ward who are dying and are attached to ventilators. He's, he's using the same things that he figured out that were, were workarounds that he, he used because he knows our capacity for screwing up. He's using those things as a doctor, as a neurologist, just as he used them as a hedge fund manager. So everything in that chapter, and these are just a few examples of variations on that theme. So I'm distilling things around core idea. 
And so the theme in, in Monish's chapter is just this concept of cloning, which is the idea that so many of us are trying to be original. And so we miss this low hanging fruit that comes from actually really understanding the, the power of very carefully reverse engineering what people who are smarter and wiser than us have already figured out and then applying the best of that to our own lives in ways that suit our personality and our temperament and our talents. And that's such a profound idea that I, I wanted to go really big on that. I mean, I, I wasn't going to just dabble in something like that. I was trying to take these ideas like how to be less foolish or how to clone or how to deal with the fact that the future is unknowable and everything is changing. And yet we have to make decisions about the future. I was trying to take these big themes and take them as far as I could. And so I'm not mentioning everything. I'm distilling the essence of it. But there's a kind of refinement and refinement and refinement to a point where you say, ah, that's what it means. Mm. And that's part of the joy of writing, actually, is this intellectual pursuit. And there's a there's a wonderful line. There's a guy I write about called Matthew McLennan, who I admire a lot, who thinks got a very, very elegant mind, who said to me that he keeps these ideas of his in, I, I think it's just in his iPhone, that are these, these ideas that he just goes over and over again and again, that might be, I guess, about why gold is important, why gold is a useful p permanent hedge against extreme circumstances or I, I mean, he, he, he's just a fascinating guy. He's got a really deep and interesting view of how to be a resilient investor over, over many, many decades. And he says that he goes over those ideas as if he's raking a Zen garden. <laughs> and that's what it feels like yeah. to me. It's like you're refining and refining these ideas to a point where it's actually, it's kind of exquisite. I mean, when, there was a moment where I was working on this chapter about Joe Greenblatt, which is all about the power of simplicity, both in investing and life. And there was a point where I literally came up in chills, where I just thought, ah, that's it. Mm. And it was like my body was telling me, oh, that's actually true. And I'm not saying this in a self-congratulatory way, because it's I'm, I'm taking Joel's ideas and sharing what he's figured out over decades. And he's got a brilliant mind and is kind of a code breaker. But then I'm connecting it to all of these other things that I'm interested in that he hasn't read in other fields. And so I'm seeing connections between simplicity in investing and simplicity in spirituality or science or business. And there's a there's a deep joy in seeing those connections. And 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 Matt McLennan said to me, when you really reduce an idea to its essence and you really feel it's true, he said it's it's similar to the joy of catching a wave. Uh, what I want to tell the listener is that there's there's as you can see, Williams spent the significant part of his life honing the craft of writing, just the craft of being, in a certain sense, a wordsmith. But but what has gone into this book, I would argue, in a certain way, is beyond what Robert Caro did, is that I, William has the encyclopedic notes, but but then the communication is not just... I can't find pun. them. <laughs> you can't but sometimes can't find, find them, them yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, that, that process of distillation that that you described, William, I think that what it results is that there's there's communication on a far deeper level. And, you know, what I want to believe is that there are some books that just the act of reading those books makes you wiser and you don't even know why, because there's been, yes, you've heard the story of you read the, the, the sort of the, the surface level, but there are things that are going on on a much deeper level that the author is doing with you. And I very strongly believe that that's the case with your book, which is why I'm so excited to see it come out. Oh, thanks. And you can see... There's a lot of stuff concealed in my book. Yeah, so, so let's dive into that. Tell us about how you concealed stuff or what you wanted to conceal. And you don't have to reveal what you concealed, but but so, so you know, and I don't know how to describe it because I don't fully... I have not fully understood the meaning of William's book, but this is this is way more than what you read on the surface. But to, so so so, give us a window. Well, I, I'll give you an example of it, just that randomly comes to mind. When I was deciding what to do with the chapter about Nick Sleep and Zach, who've never really talked publicly about how they beat the market by eight hundred percentage points in thirteen years, and then closed down, returned all the money, and decided that they would spend 
the second half of their lives giving the money away for the most part. And and I met Nick because of you, right? I mean, I don't think he ever would have talked to me otherwise. And because we kind of built this relationship and I think he trusted me, but at a certain point I had this amazing opportunity to tell this story that nobody had ever told about what they did. And Nick at one point said that Nomad, the fund that they created, was in some way a rejection of the sin and folly of Wall Street. And there's something deeply spiritual and deeply, he, he would say metaphysical about what they were doing. It was an intellectual experiment to try to see, this is one reason why they were so obsessed with Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, is because that book is about the pursuit of quality. And Percy, the novelist there says, well, there's a quality way to, to do anything and a low quality way to do anything. And that and that relates to whether you're writing a book, mending a dress, working on your motorcycle. He, he says, when you're working on your motorcycle, the real motorcycle you're working on is the motorcycle inside you. You know, it's you. And so there's a kind of inner and an outer of everything. And so, so I didn't know, there's nobody giving you the rules about how to write a book. You don't really have any idea. You're flying blind. It's It's kind of like saying, Set up a set up a hedge fund. It's like, yeah, well, what kind of hedge fund? Well, you know, there are so many ways to do it, and so I didn't really know how I was going to tell their story, and I thought, and nobody had really heard of them. They were pretty obscure. They were kind of legends within the field. I mean, people like Bill Miller invested his own money with them, and you had told me how extraordinary Nick was, and, and Monish had told me, yeah, he'd be an amazing guy to write about, but he'll never talk to you. So I knew that I had something special. But I thought, well, maybe I need to write about them and a bunch of other investors in the same chapter. So I don't pin ev anything, everything on these unknown guys who are extraordinary. And then the whole Supreme Court battle blew up where that, that woman was getting kind of tarnished. She was accusing the, the Republican nominee of, of having um, actually harassed her. Yeah, Kavanaugh. And she was getting kind of smeared. And I was kind of... I was kind of upset by it. The whole thing kind of felt sort of tawdry and mean-spirited and, and vicious and the worst of politics in every way. And I'm, I'm not saying this in a sort of particularly partisan way, but I found it all really upsetting. And that was when I thought, I'm going to go big on Nick and Zach, and I'm going to write a whole chapter about them, because actually what this is about is a different way of viewing the world and approaching life and the way they treat each other, how decent they are. I mean, Nick said to me, there's a kindness to this relationship that's so central to our success. Mm -hmm. And the way they treated their shareholders was, they, they, they kept changing their fee structure so that it became worse for themselves and better for their shareholders. And they were very focused on the long term and not on the short term and, and, and on creating value for other people. And even their approach to charity is very deeply about how do we create the maximum long-term benefit for society. So in some ways, for me, this is one of the things that's kind of concealed is that, yeah, it's a profile of these two remarkable guys and of what they figured out about how to win in markets. But it's also, there's something actually quite philosophical and quite spiritual about it, that they become my way of saying, there is a better way to live and there's a better way to do capitalism. And there's a better way to treat other people. So in some ways, the book is a sort of, I don't, I don't want to put off people by sounding like I'm a proselytizer, but in some ways it's a stealth spiritual book because I'm, I'm intentionally selecting people who I think in some way are really honorable people that we can learn from. And I have no doubt they're all yeah. deeply flawed people, some more than others, but there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful thing that I quote from Buffett's forward to Janet Lowe's book on Munger, Damn Right, where he says, in, f in 41 years, I've never seen Charlie take advantage of anyone. Mm. And he's knowingly taken the worst side of a deal with me and other people on multiple occasions. And he always takes more than his share of the blame for anything that goes wrong and less of his share of credit. So when I'm writing that, I'm not trying to, bash the reader over the head but i've selected that for a reason and i find that deeply moving yeah. the fact that after 41 years of their partnership at that point that's what buffett says about munger and there was a beautiful moment where 
when I was interviewing Munga, this was actually at the end of the Daily Journal meeting where a group of us was around him. So he didn't say this just to me, where I asked him a question and he and he said about what had made for a happy life. And he's, he was talking about partnerships. And he said, Warren has been a marvelous partner to me and I've been a good partner to him. And even that phrasing, the fact that he understated his own excellence in the relationship and was effusive about Warren's. There's something really helpful about yeah. that as a way to manage our own lives. So I'm trying to select things throughout the book where I think this is someone I want to learn from. And there are very few people in the book that I don't really admire. I, I've, I've intentionally selected people I think are, can help us to live better as well as invest better. You know, I realize that I, I don't know what the journalistic rights and wrongs of me writing a review of the book somewhere, but, you know, read this book and like Nick and Zach, you will also have an excellent adventure. In a certain way, mm. the, the book is an invitation to every reader to have their own excellent adventure and the likelihood of having that excellent adventure, I have absolutely no doubt is improved enormously just through reading that book. And, and I, I don't know how else to say it, when there's something eternal, you, you, you can never explain exactly what it is. But there are books that you can hold in your hand that transform you, even though you don't know why. I guess I'm going back to the same point. And, and I think that it, it is a spiritual book. And in a certain way, it's a reflection of your journey. And, you know, in the, in the Jewish tradition, there's this idea that every person, every good Jew, I guess, should write out their own Sefer Torah or uh, Torah scroll. But in a certain way, every person should write out their spiritual journey, every person. And in a certain way, this is your Torah scroll, isn't it? Yeah, but at the same time, what I'm really trying to do is distill what other people have learned. So there is something self-referential about it, but I'm trying to focus, maybe there's an element of hiding again behind other people, but I'm focusing on people who I think have a great deal to teach. And so, for, for example, I write about Jack Bogle, who I interviewed 20 years ago, and I, I, I don't know if anyone will notice this because it's tucked away in a section of the book called Notes on Additional Sources and Resources, which in some ways is my favorite part of the book because <laughs> it's just yeah. stuff that I, I tucked away that almost no one would notice so I, could, that, so I could get away with stuff. There's a thing where, for example, I talk about phoning Bogle 20 something years ago, probably 21 years ago, something like that, to interview him. And I was interviewing him about this guy, Walter Morgan, who was his mentor and role model, who hired him at the start of his career and who was a pioneering mutual fund manager. And the phone goes dead while I'm talking to Bogle. And, and I'm saying, um, Mr. Bogle, are you there? Sorry, did I lose you? And suddenly I realized that he's crying. And he said, I'm sorry, it's, it's putting tears in my eyes. And I, I'm sort of struggling to think, well, what am I supposed to say? And I, I, I say, well, sorry, how, how come? And he said, well, I realized how much I loved him and how much he did for me. And there was something enormously moving about that, that here you have this kind of legendary and pretty tough guy who was the pioneer of index funds and created Vanguard that now manages what, 6.2, 6.3 trillion dollars and has changed millions of people's lives. And he's crying as he talks about his mentor. And so, yeah, it's my journey to some degree, this book. I, I mean, it is, there's clearly an element of that, but I'm also in some way paying respect to someone like Walter Morgan, who's dead, and Jack Bogle, who's dead and who was his mentee. And Bogle said to me, I was asking him what he'd learned from Morgan. And he said, well, he said, the shareholder is king. And he said, my God, one of our clients wrote to Walter Morgan and said, Mr. Morgan, I don't have a suit. And Mr. Morgan sent him one of his own suits. And so for me, there, there's an aspect of me reminding myself and other people about what kind of behavior endures. And I don't know. So it, it, in some ways, it's an aspirational book. It's it's not like, oh, here's how you should behave because this is how I behave because I behave <laughs> crappily. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, well, I do plenty of, you should see me getting bad tempered. Um, but it's a reminder to me of, oh, that's, that's how you're supposed to behave. And it's interesting to me, none of us know how rich Walter Morgan yeah. was. 
I'm sure as a pioneer in the mutual fund business, he did great. But this is what I remember is the fact that he gave a suit to a shareholder that he didn't know in his fund and that that had this enduring impact on Jack Bogle and that Jack Bogle has had this enduring impact yeah. on us. I, I also do this in the chapter where I write about, in the epilogue where I about, write about Arnold Vandenberg. I made a point of naming the three families who saved his life and his siblings' life during yeah. the Holocaust. They, they hid him, they shuffled him around between families. They sneaked him into the countryside to hide him in an orphanage. That's one of the one of wonderful and scary things about writing a book is there's nobody to tell you not to do it. <laughs> and so you can do things like that where you just say, I have no idea if people are going to look at this and think I'm a moron. Yeah. You know, when I first started writing the book, when I sent when I sent my book proposal to Scribner, which is this great publisher that's, you know, they published Hemingway, Ness Scott Fitzgerald and stuff. My editor there, who's the executive editor, is a uh, brilliant guy, said, one of his few comments on the proposal was, I don't understand why Vandenberg is in the book. I don't understand why he fits in. And that was a really interesting challenge for me because I regard him, he, he and Monish were the first two people I interviewed for the book because I knew that I wanted to go big on the idea of cloning and big on the idea of why Arnold Vandenberg is such an exemplary human being and why in some ways I regard him as the most successful investor mm -hmm. Not, not the most successful investor, but the most successful human being in the investment business. And one of the things I really loved was because I had to rise to that challenge of explaining why he's so important. When I was done with the book, my editor said something about how I, 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 think, I think the Charlie Munger chapter was probably his favorite. And then he said, yeah, except maybe the stuff about Arnold. <laughs> and that meant that I'd actually sort of proven why he was important. Yeah. But it's often... When you're writing a book, you really don't know. You don't know what the rules are and what you can get away with saying, when you can make jokes and when you can be self-referential. And it's 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 really like you're f um, doing this high-wire trapeze act without a net under you. And that, I mean, that's why you and I became close is because I came in at a time in your book when, and we were already friends, but I came in at a time in your book where I think you were at the end of your tether yeah. and you were really tired and your deadline was looming and i came in and helped to drag you over the finish line at a point where you were you were incredibly exposed and you didn't really know how to get to the finish line yeah well actually um in my case the editor and the publisher were, were had, they decided that he'd, he'd crawled as far as he could get and they were oh. willing to move the finish line towards me <laughs> <laughs> and I remember they gave us a lot of latitude, which was an amazing, an amazing thing. It was an act of courage on their part that they gave us. They gave us the space yeah. to do what we needed to do. I would just tell you, in obviously two very different books. In my case, you know, not a professional writer, but you know, it's very obviously. And and I don't know Rick, but in what you've related to me, you, I mean, you, over over the course of your professional career, you had earned the right. To, to write it on your own and you'd earn the right to make those decisions. I think that what's, so somebody like me writing what I wrote, I had the comfort of editors around to carry me through. Whereas you had reached a level of respect in your industry where the only thing that you're kind of like comparing yourself to is posterity. The only thing is the decision, you know, it's, it's, it's you're kind of facing eternity. Because because nobody has the stature to challenge what you're going to put in or leave out. I don't think that's true. I think <laughs> I think you have a you have a an elevated <laughs> view view of me that's not justified yeah. by but by the reality. Like, I'm grateful I, for it. But. We only have about ten minutes I left. Question. I want I want to ask you something because yeah. uh, I write I write about you in in the chapter where I'm writing a, a, a great deal about Tom Gaynor and I write about the idea of compounding goodwill. Yeah. And I talk about Gaynor, I, I coined this phrase that I was very proud of, so I'm gonna repeat it, which is the, the mensch effect, which is just the fact that he's a real mensch and he just treats people incredibly kindly and he regards that as a competitive advantage. And I see that in your life that you're absolutely surrounded by people who wish you well and who you, you treat very kindly. And 
I think that's been in writing this book, that's been one of the great lessons for me, particularly in this process of of actually the publication of it and all the help that you need in terms of getting it out, getting it over the finish line. The number of extraordinarily generous, decent, kind people who are just helping. It's it's kind of amazing and quite kind of deeply moving. And I wondered if you could just talk about that idea, because I think it's such a profound idea. And there one of the things that I say in the book is that you need to take there's a beautiful line from Munger where he says, take a simple idea and take it seriously. And one of the things that I hope people will do in my book is take a few of these really powerful ideas, like uh, like the power of long-term compounding without catastrophe, just avoiding catastrophe or or the importance of, of not doing anything stupid or just elim- you know reducing the amount of stupid things you do. But I think one of the most powerful ideas that I don't go into in great detail is this idea of the compounding of goodwill and the mensch effect. And mm-hmm. I just, I just wanted to ask you, what, what you, what you have to say about it, because I think you're you're a great practitioner of it. Well, let the record show that we got about an, at least an hour into this before William turned the tables and decided to screw this. I'm going to go back to being a journalist and be yeah. ask guy the questions. I I remember the first time we had lunch was somewhere in Midtown and I didn't know William at all. You were a you were an editor at Money magazine, I believe, at the time. Yeah. Which was part of the, yeah. the Fortune uh, group. And I remember coming out of the lunch exhausted. It was the first time I had really had lunch with somebody who was a curious journalist. And huh. it was just an endless barrage of, of of questions. Each one of them required an investment of my time or my energy to answer them. But it's okay, I have to do the the honor of responding to that. And of course, as you know, I was a bit of an asshole. And really, I, I really had taken on this idea that to, to be to be successful in the world of business, you've got to be a little bit of a shit. You know, my my three notes a day, I, I got addicted to it. I, I just realized it's a wonderful place to be. And and this this re- Is it, thank you. Yeah, and this realization that if you give and and you give when people don't expect it, uh, or when they do expect it, but especially when they don't expect it, the the world is so much more exciting and interesting. And I, I've just become addicted to the process, and I enjoy finding new and creative ways <laughs> to be generous, and and sort of learning how to be smart, generous. And you know, at the time that I was writing my book the grant adam grant book came out which kind of like you know mm. which which teaches a lot about how to be smart generous but i don't think you'd actually read it because i remember jason zweig saying have you have you read it at the time and you said no i've i've got it but i haven't yeah read it. well you know he he maybe ideas when they're ready to come out in the world they come out so i think every now and then i see it around me i think what's really exciting is when i see somebody who tries that mode of living and they realize that it's got more rewards and it's kind of like they've discovered the lodestone. And that's really exciting because this is the, the process of being a mensch is not a zero sum game. And it's just so much fun to live in, in a world where you're bathed in that stuff. And it's kind of. What's interesting is that people always say, I don't know if you've found this, whenever I talk about friends of mine like you or, or people like Tom Gaynor who just behave really kindly. People always say, well, it's easy for them. Look how rich they are. Yeah. And I, I think that's a total misunderstanding, but there's something in it because there's that beautiful line from Ben Franklin that Buffett and Munger often quote, which is that an empty sack can't stand straight. I think there is a degree of truth in it that when you're coming from a place of lack and fear, it's very difficult to be generous. But, I mean, it's harder to be generous. But I sometimes think, you know, Tony Robbins often says this, that you you need to start being charitable when you have very little, because if you're not prepared to give away $5, when you have $100, you're not going to be prepared to give away 50000 when you have $10 million. Yeah. I think there's a leap of faith in changing from the system that you and I grew up with when we were kids in England, which is a very out of scorecard, very competitive dog-eat-dog system. Mm. And I think probably because we're both Jewish and we came from families that had been refugees. And so there's a sense of you better look out for yourself because the world is a scary and hostile place. And so I think we had internalized in some ways all of the fearfulness and competitiveness and ego and self-servingness of that system. And then we had to get to a point where it actually no longer worked because you realize 
this just actually doesn't make me very happy. And so I think you you were several years ahead of me on this, yeah. where you were already being really kind and decent to people. But I slightly resented it because I was like, well, of course, the fucker can afford to be happy with people. <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, William and I are both people who grew up in the UK, sort of half in, half outside the UK. And William, when I look at UK politics right now, that system of dog eat dog seems to be so alive and well in uh, British politics, at least. And it's kind of shocking to me because I think that, and, and William and I know multiple people in the upper reaches of the English British government right now, because I don't think they've learned anything. And I ask myself, what would have happened if you or I could have pulled them in some way into the circle of the kinds of people who are in your book? I think, you know, I'd like to believe that British politics would be a better place. But I, I know you have answers to that. But I want to round out because we're getting close to the end of you know, we could do this for hours. There are kind of just two two other places that I want to go with you, William. And now I'm turning the tables back on you because as you can see, William is going to ask me lots more questions. Yeah. No, but I want to but I yeah. want to finish that. Finish it and then I I'll come with two more questions. Go ahead. I actually think there's a really important takeaway for your listeners, which is that I think it's an act of courage and a leap of faith to think there's a different system, that there's a more enlightened way to do things where you try to share more and be more more caring, more loving, more sharing, more kinder, less self-defensive. And I think it's an act of courage. And I, I would say what's miraculous to me is to see the benefits. And I think you saw the benefits many years before me. And I sometimes look around now and I'm just so astonished by the quality and the kindness of the people around me yeah. I, i'm sort of overwhelmed by it yeah. at times and I, I think you're having to bet on something ineffable where you think well maybe it's true but then there are all these reinforcing things that tell me no i have to have yeah. sharp elbows i have to i just urge people actually to experiment with this idea of compounding goodwill trying to be more of a mensch not and i'm not saying this in a self-righteous sanctimonious way i just think it's actually it's so transformative in your own life that you sometimes look at it and you just think, I, I, I can't believe I wasted all of those years being such a prick yeah. and just trying to look out for myself and always having an agenda. And I still have lots of agendas and I, I can still be a prick lots of the time. <laughs> but I think in the way that you say that you became more addicted to behaving well, I think that's a you get a taste yeah. of it and you start to be all like this is just much more fun. Yeah. I'm much happier. And um and just to, to to give you an illustration of the path that I was on, I think this happened well before we collaborated on the education of a value investor. So I'm kind of expanding my goodwill creation activities. And then what happens is is that uh, somebody is calling up my office and is feeling extraordinarily grateful to the whole organization and wants to shower gifts onto one of one of my employees and so i'm on one of these trips like the one that you took with monish to india and i sort of say well you know that stuff's coming back to my employees not to me and i'm still in this sharp elbowed mm -hmm. mode where i feel like it should all be huh. coming back to me and and you know it was it was it was part of the kind of like the many lessons that i've learned around monish who's such a great subject in the book but Monish says, and and why is that? What's wrong with that? So if the, if the gift mm. comes back to them and not to you, and and why why do you care? It's it's more love in the world, so to speak. And and you know, and and that probably took another few weeks before it trickled in, and I wasn't bent out of shape that the goodwill that I was initiating was coming back to somebody else. And then you know what's amazing is that I think that I've attracted high quality people to work with me because. When you start doing that, the universe figures out there's something nice going on around this person and people start wanting to associate with you and work with you. And so, you know, it's it's not something that I woke up one day and became a mensch. It's it's a work in progress and it's taken a long time to get to where I am. And and I suspect that Tom Gaynor and Arnold Fundenberg, I mean, they, they, when he identifies yeah. it, it, the kind of generosity that he's shown to me, He's shown to our mutual friend Sarah Madan. He's shown to you is is again. It's yeah. that same place. He called me yesterday to see how he could help with something. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's a busy guy. He's in the middle of moving his business, moving his office, and he's calling me to see how he can help. And I think what's really lovely is you see the joy that he gets 
out of helping other people. You know, I'm on this call with him yesterday with his son, Scott and, uh, and Arnold together. And you just hear the love between these two guys. So just think of the fact that they've worked together for all of these years and that Scott just loves his dad. He's just really proud of him. And, it, uh, you know, the benefits of being a mensch are so multifaceted. Yeah. I mean, it's not just that you're going to do better in your, your professional life because you're going to attract better partners who treat you more honestly and decently. It's you have more self-respect. You, your kids like you more. You, I think I just didn't really want to write about great investors who just had lawsuits the whole time yeah. and were feuding with their partner. And it was really interesting to me to see someone like Howard Marks when I fact-checked with him, the chapter that I wrote about him, one of the few things he really wanted me to to change, I hope I'm not revealing anything that I shouldn't, was he wanted me to make sure that I gave enough credit to his partner, Bruce Kosh. Mm. I thought that was really interesting. He wasn't trying to make himself look better. Yeah. He wanted to make sure that I didn't neglect to show the, the enormous role that his partner had played. And Howard takes such pride in the fact that he and Bruce Kosh, his partner, haven't had an argument in 30 years of working together. Yeah. And that, that's really interesting that you have someone like Howard, who's a brilliant man, who's worth a couple of billion dollars, managing, what, $120 billion he's overseeing, a thousand people in his company. And he really takes pride in the quality of his relationship with his partner in the same way that Charlie takes pride in the quality of his, his relationship with Warren. I think when you start to see that there are these great examples of human behavior and how to do capitalism. It takes a leap of faith to say, yeah, well, that's the team I want to be on. Mm -hmm. and, and Tom Gaynor, I once said to him, you know, do you sometimes worry that this is just naive and it's just doggy dog? Because I kind of lost a political battle at the time and I got laid off and I was like, well, maybe it is all just mad doggy dog and you should just be looking out for yourself. And he's like, well, even if I'm wrong and even if this isn't the way we should be, it's still good and I'm still happy to do it. And it's still, it just makes for a better life. And I, I thought that was a lovely answer. Like even, even if people do sometimes take advantage of you and you do sometimes seem naive, it's still a better way to live and you're happier for it. It's, it's something that takes, you know, you, you, you made a little bit of uh, your, um, your mind being all over the place, but I would tell you that there's, there's a certain amount of discipline that's required. You, I, I, I argue it's a bit like filling a bucket. So, People like Tom Gaynor and um, you know m many of the people in the book, the, the bucket is sloshing full of goodwill. Mm. But you know you can only drop drops into that bucket, and it could take a decade of dropping drops into that bucket until the kind of goodwill is overflowing. And meanwhile, mm. you have a relatively empty bucket. But it's only the people who can be disciplined about it for a long period of time, about being generous, intelligently generous, until the rewards start coming back. And I think that many people have got much shorter time horizons. And mm -hmm. I would tell you, William, that in your writerly way, I think you've been you've been doing that actually for as long as I've known you. I mean, you know, the first bit of writing that William and I did together was a sort of a report on my and Monish's launch with Warren Buffett. And I, you know, the I remember writing to you, you know, I sort of said, William, you took my inchoate thoughts and made me look really smart and yeah. that was an act of generosity and giving and in the in the writing you know some of the books that you've produced uh with other people you were doing that in in the book that you produced with me that you were doing that in a certain way again this book is a culmination of an enormous amount of giving you've been other people's voices for so long and so so it's really fun for me i'm going to round up the three questions that, okay. that i'll give them all to you at once and they're, they're <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not short That's answers, message, but, yeah, but you'll have yeah. fun with it. You can even note it down and then I'll just be yeah. quiet and listen to you. So every book is a journey and you cannot write a book like the one that you've written without going through a profound transformation yourself. And so I, it may be too early to tell because we're in this sort of strange period now where the book's been produced, but it hasn't been released properly into the wild. But I'd love to get a sense of how you think you've changed through writing the book. And these are kind of, in a sense, unrelated, mm. but maybe they are related. And, you know, you're an extraordinary re reader of fiction. And two writers that just stick in my mind 
from the time that we were working together in the book that you discussed. One is Isaac Pesheva Singer, where you you, re- you read a story to me and my family one night, and you actually shed a few tears after having mm. read it. And another writer whom I've not read, but completely unrelated in a certain way, in search of lost time. But I, I really, I don't feel like this conversation is complete without hearing you talk a little bit about fiction writing and how it's impacted you. So two, three huge questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all related, like everything. So Isaac Besheva Singer was this wonderful writer who came from a not dissimilar background to mine, where he he was from this Polish Jewish family that had suffered enormously during the Holocaust. And he came out and he moved to New York. And I sometimes think, I mean, there's, there's a book about his childhood that I really love, Days of Pleasure, that pretends to be a kid's book, but isn't really. And it's uh, that's probably what I read you from. It's just exquisite. It's one of my all-time favorite books. And I think one of the things that happened with Singer is that when you've been through that fire, it burns away all of the fakery and the pretense and the posturing. And he was paying tribute to this world that had disappeared. He was also writing about human nature in a very powerful, very honest way. So he writes about this kind of yearning to be a more spiritual, more elevated person, and the war that he and his characters are in, where they're also pulled towards lust and physical pleasure. And and so he's not hiding from the fact that there's this tremendous conflict between our, our yearning to be better and more elevated and the baser side of our nature. And that that plays out in a lot of his books. So you were asking me how I changed as a writer and as a person while I was working on this book. And in a sense, I think the journey I'm on and the journey that you're on is not dissimilar to what Singer in his way had reached, which is to try to become more authentic, more truthful, to shed a lot of the bullshit and the pretense and the fakery and the posturing and the do they admire me and will they think I'm smart and will it, you know, and to try to become more more true to yourself, more aligned. You were asking me before what what I had learned from studying various Kabbalistic texts. You asked me before we um we started this conversation. There's this very beautiful idea within Kabbalah, which is that this is from a great Kabbalistic sage guy called Rav Ashlag, who, who I wrote some of the, the great books that I've read that had a huge impact on me. And one of the things that he said is that you start off your life with just what he calls the desire for the self alone, which is the ego. It's me, 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 me. And I, I think he talks about how babies have their, their hands clenched, you know, it's closed, right? And they're crying for what you want. And your trajectory through your lifetime is to transform that desire for the self alone into the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. So it's, yeah, I still want stuff. I still want all of those blessings. I want to have a family and kids and a nice house and money in the bank and good work and friendship and uh, all of those things and a car and whatever. But as Rav Ashlag says, it's to transform to this point of where, where the desire for the self alone becomes the desire to receive for the sake of sharing. And I think when I see people like Arnold Vandenberg, that's what he embodies in some very deep sense. It's somebody who started with lots of rage and lots of anger because he'd been victimized during the Holocaust and he's transformed himself over the years. He, he, you know, he literally hypnotized himself for years. So he would say over and over again, things like, I am a loving person. And so he removed the rage from himself mm. gradually. So I think there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful line from Rav Ashlag where he says that we're all, we're all like unripened fruit and we're all just at a different stage in our evolution. And so just as you wouldn't hate, you know, you wouldn't judge an apple because it's sour, because it's not yet ready. That's the same with each of us. We're all at different stages in our evolution. And whether this is true, I'm not trying to be a proselytizer or holier than thou, sanctimonious or anything. I think it's a useful metaphor. It's a useful way to see the world. And so for me, I'm sort of on this trajectory where I'm trying consciously to transform more of my ego to become kind of more sharing and a bit kinder and stuff. And I, and I think writing a book is a very, 
it's a process that's very full of ego, right? It's look at me, look how smart I am, look at my ideas, look at my name in bright lights, you know? And so there's a polarity to everything, right? You can, if you are running a fund, it can be all about how rich I am, how, how smart I am, how powerful, how right I am. Or it can be, yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm a custodian of other people's savings and let me manage it in a responsible way so that I can, so that I can help them to pay for their retirement, so I can help for their kids' education, so that I can give them financial security. And so I think we have we have both of these sides in our nature, and they're all they're, they're sort of dueling. So this for me, this this is the battle that I'm kind of waging, and I think it's the battle that that Isaac Bashevis Singer was talking about between between your your physical lust and your you know your material desires and your yearning to be something more elevated. I find it very helpful to think of it in those terms. That that that's the trajectory of our lives is to try to is to try to ripen. And you know, Shakespeare said, "The ripeness is all." Mm. And so, we're just trying to ripen and 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 gradually become a little kinder, a little more loving, a little more sharing, a little less ego, a little less fear, stuff like that. And I I think I think part, maybe this is partly why I wanted to talk about the compounding of goodwill with you is that I actually think. What's lovely about it is that you taste the benefits of it and you actually start to be like, oh, this feels good. Mm -hmm. And when I see someone like Ed Thorpe as well, who I write about, like I admire Ed a lot. And he's a guy in his late 80s now, probably 86, 87, something like that. Who's just a brilliant, brilliant mind, more brilliant than than any of any, any of us. And yet he um more brilliant of, than Bill Miller. Mm, Possibly, Bill would probably think so. Bill was very happy that I included him in a in a sentence alongside uh, alongside Ed and and Munger as people who I think are just operating on a different level. He was like, "Wow, that's nice. I'll, I'll take that. That's very nice." Uh, um, yeah. So Thorpe, who's utterly brilliant, talked to me about how when he managed his fund, he very consciously thought, "How do I structure this so that it's fair to my shareholders?" And he said. You can get an edge in life by ripping people off. And he said, you know, you rip more raw meat off the carcass of life. But then he said, but when you're done, you're left with nothing. Uh, so I so I don't know. I think I think these people that I'm writing about, we're I'm not trying to idealize anyone or lionize anyone, because uh, you know, we all have our different set of flaws and weirdnesses. But I think when you read about people like Ed Thorpe or Munger or Nick and Zach, you're thinking, oh yeah, th this is this is just a better way to operate. And so I hope I hope that my book is kind of clarifying for people and it makes them think, yeah, uh, let me tilt the balance. I yeah, I'm unripened fruit, but in whatever in whatever way, let me tilt the balance towards this type of behavior because not only is it more enlightened and wiser, but it's actually going to make me happier. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, it, the listener will realize I often. I, William will reach me on FaceTime. Often, it's with you, and and what's it was a ten minute time as a conversation <laughs> goes into a couple of hours. I would love to. There's so many places I could dive into, uh, and but we have to bring this to a close. I I would just an image that I didn't share earlier that I want to share right now is a picture taken by one of Charlie Munger's grandchildren. And it, it, uh, Charlie Munger's face is hidden, but he's got a copy of Richer, Wiser, Happier. I happen to know that he's, he's read the book thoroughly. He thoroughly enjoyed the book. He was sharing some of the things that he's learned, and, and Charlie was engrossed in it. And the picture shows him clearly engrossed in the book because he knows many of the characters in the book, but he's learning a lot about them. And I think that's a, perhaps a wonderful image to leave, with, to leave hmm. the listener with. And you should know that although the listener won't see it, I'm glad you have it. There's a, an image of the book uh, up to the left of your head, William. It's a great cover. But uh, your last wow. words to the listeners of this podcast, just uh, some anything you wanted to get out but couldn't that you can say standing on one leg in less than three uh, sentences. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to say thanks to you because you've been a great friend and supporter and champion over the years. And, and I've I've benefited greatly from your initially cynical desire to compound goodwill because <laughs> I just was the recipient as, as I became uh, more and more altruistic and selfless and 
And you've just been, you know, you've been a great force for good in my mm-hmm. life in so many ways. And when I started writing your book with you, I, I was kind of beaten up. I mean, I'd been going through a really tough period where, you know, the financial crisis and getting laid off and stuff, it had really dented me and I felt bruised and my confidence was knocked. And it was very hard. And you actually played a really powerful practical role in kind of shifting my life in a better direction. And so in, in some very real way, this book actually probably wouldn't, wouldn't exist without you. Yeah. And so thank you. Well, thank you. And um, well, actually, I, I, I'm compelled to say this. One of the things that I've discovered in getting around these generators of goodwill, of which Warren Buffett is a master and, and Monish Pabra is a master, and is that you, you'll find the, the, the person doing things for you and people around them that you cannot repay ever in a lifetime. They're just things that you cannot describe mm, what the value is, priceless. And, you know, the example that I give... See, I'm always having to find words for you, Guy. Thank you. <laughs> You're still finding right. words for me, exactly. <laughs> and, and Warren Buffett's done things like that for me, and I'm a nothing in his life. But uh, what William did for me is that he, he, he found this, you know, not very verbal, not a wordsmith, not all of those things, and he helped me get my message out. And you've done that for others. But I can say that that is something that is priceless. It's a gift that's priceless. You cannot you cannot put a value on what you did for me. And I remember saying to you, and I will be eternally grateful, I hope that over the course of our lives, you'll find out how grateful I am. <laughs> hey, well, I feel yeah. like I already have. Yeah. And, you know, I said to you once when we were leaving, and I'll, I'll let you go because we've exhausted your <laughs> listeners. But, um, yeah, we'll let I the listeners you- go. I'll stick around, but... <laughs> No, but I said to you once as we were leaving Omaha, I said that this great teacher of mine once had said that you're, you're truly blessed if you have one true friend in life. And I think, I think you know, we're both lucky that we have more than, more than one. But I think that's really, you know, the benefit that you get from your relationships when you behave decently with people is so enormous. It's so astounding that it, and so like most great truths, these things are pretty banal. But when you actually taste the benefits of these simple ideas, like, like, compounding goodwill or trying to be a decent human being the benefits are so profound that it actually kind of stops you in your track and you're like oh that's what they meant <laughs> it's great so i, I guess I, the, the, my parting thought is just i hope more people get to taste this because yeah. it's actually it's really delightful and it's just a much better way to live than the one that we grew up with of like let me make sure that i'm okay yeah and, and- and- It'll get somebody else has to lose, which is just a crappy way to live. The, the, you know, I think you know, swords will be turned into plowshares, and the lamb. You know, it's it's actually the creation of heaven on earth in a certain way. But so, yeah. th- thank you, William. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, guy. <laughs>